I'm honored to introduce Thomas Hales, and uh, for that I had to punch his Wikipedia page. <laughs> <laughs> so it says here that Tom is the winner of the Shobnev Prize in 2003, Lester Ford Award in 2008, fellow of the American Mathematical Society, and that he was invited to give the Harsky Lectures in 2019, and his lectures were entitled A Form of Proof of the Kepler Conjecture, Formalizing Mathematics and Integrating <laughs> Logic. And of course, he's known to us in the community for hacking, for proving the honeycomb conjecture, the Kepler conjecture, and the still controversial business of proving things using computers. So, <laughs> very interesting talk, I'm sure it's coming up. So, over to you, Tom. I'd like to thank the organizers for this chance to speak today uh, on the topic of unpackability um, and the Reinhardt conjecture. Uh, I want to acknowledge my collaborator on this project. Uh, this started as a preprint I posted to the archive 2017. And then uh, my collaborator, Cody, wrote a thesis that he finished last year. And then there are a lot of results that weren't in the thesis. And we've put it together uh, that a book uh, should soon become available on our research. Uh, so some shapes fill the plane more efficiently than others. Uh, if we take equilateral triangles, they fill space uh, the plane quite efficiently. They tile, the same with squares, same with regular hexagons. So we say that these shapes are very packable in the sense that we get very high density by arranging them in an efficient way. Well, parallelograms are, um, they tile space. Again, they're a very packable shape. Fish are very <laughs> packable. <laughs> they tile the plane. Uh, shapes that don't tile the plane include circles, pentagons, regular pentagons. So the uh, circle packing problem was solved by two around 1890. Uh, the optimal arrangement is what we see here. The density is pi over root 12. Uh, so circles are less packable than squares in this sense. And uh, with Voden uh, Kustner, uh, we solved the Pentagon packing problem. Uh, what you see here is the optimal packing of pentagons, and the density is a little over 92%. So pentagons are a little more packable than circles. We get a little higher density with pentagons than circles. Um, so in uh, this work, we're excluding non-convex regions. Uh, you could take something like a box and empty it out. And then uh, if there's nothing inside, you're going to have very low density because of the big empty region inside. So we're going to assume uh, that we're dealing with convex disks uh, for packing. Uh, the other assumption is uh, central symmetry. So. Uh, a camel is an example of something that is not centrally symmetric. Uh, same with a triangle. If I rotate by 180 degrees, do I get back? Or I start with the same shape? Quick question. So you you had um, no holes. Yes. Inside, but you said also convex. So those are two separate things, right? You could have so a... We're assuming, we're assuming convexity. Your convexity and the holes. Yeah, okay. And we're also assuming central symmetry. So those are our two assumptions on what we're packing. Convex, centrally symmetric. Uh, Escher's hands gives us an algorithm for drawing centrally symmetric figures. You just uh, do uh, repeat uh, centrally symmetrically when you draw the shape. Uh, 
So an interesting case are uh, centrally symmetric hexagons. So you get such by starting with a parallelogram and flipping both corners in a centrally symmetric way. And any centrally symmetric hexagon will tile space. So that's an example of something that's uh, very packable. Uh, so the question that I'm looking at today is what centrally symmetric convex disk has the property that it's most unpackable in the sense that when I pack it in the optimal way, the density is the lowest. So what is the most unpackable shape? And this is the Reinhardt problem that goes back to 1934. The conjecture is still open, unfortunately. Uh, so the answer is not the Pentagon because a Pentagon is not centrally symmetric and because uh, circles are more unpackable than pentagons. Um, we might ask if the circle is the most unpackable uh, shape. This, this is not, um, not the conjecture, but it's a reasonable first guess that this might be the most unpackable shape in two dimensions. Um, so we're going to use a result of Laszlo Fayish taught the father of discrete geometry. He showed that for any convex centrally symmetric disk, the best density is always obtained by fitting it with a centrally symmetric hexagon that's as small as possible. So you want to inscribe your disk inside a centrally symmetric hexagon, and then you tile with that centrally symmetric hexagon, and the translates then give you the optimal packing of that shape. So that um, <clears throat> gives you an, an easy way of determining the optimal density of any shape. So in particular, uh, Feyerstadt's apply, result applied to circles. We fit a circle with the smallest possible centrally symmetric hexagon. And in that case, it's just going to be the regular hexagon. And we tile the, with the regular hexagon. And that gives, according to Feyerstadt's theorem, the uh, densest packing of circles. Um, so this result actually gives a new proof of the uh, packing problem in two dimensions, because uh, we see the answer is the hexagonal honeycomb. Uh, so just a, a normalization, I, I rescale the hexagon so that it has a fixed area square root of 12, that's the uh, um, area of a hexagon that circumscribes um, a unit disk, and I fix that as the normalization. And then the optimization problem of finding the worst shape is becomes a problem of minimizing the area subject to the constraint that the smallest hexagon has area this constant square root of 12. So now we're doing a problem of minimizing the area. Uh, so could the worst disk be long and skinny? Well, it could be, but without loss of generality, uh, the whole problem is invariant under affine transformations. So we can apply a, an affine transformation to make the, the shape pretty round. And in fact, you can show that um, it will always, uh, I've got this star here, the region without loss of generality can be assumed to be inside the triangular regions going around by applying an appropriate affine transformation. So uh, anything that I draw here is going to be rather roundish and 
that we can assume without loss of generality. Okay, so let me describe now the conjecture that was made by Reinhardt in 1934. Uh, one way to search for the worst shape would be maybe to start with a square and then we start cutting away things that we don't need. And so we might cut away. Um, it's better. It's better. It's okay. Okay. Um, we might start cutting away from a square. If we cut away uh, opposite corners, we'll get a centrally symmetric hexagon, which tiles. So instead, let's try to cut away maybe from four corners. Uh, if we cut away too much, we'll be back to a diamond shape, which again tiles. Uh, but if we stop at an octagon, uh, that's our first guess of something that might be uh, a candidate for having a low packing density for something that's relatively unpackable. Um, hexagons going to tile, octagon comes next, centrally symmetric, we're going to take an even number of sides. If I start increasing the number of sides, it's going to look more and more like a circle, and the circle's not the answer, so we don't want to go too much in that direction with too many sides. So an octagon is sort of the first thing we might guess as being unpackable. Um, and this leads to Reinhardt's conjecture from 1934 that the, oct the octagon is not the most unpackable because you can clip the corners a little bit to make the area even smaller than a regular octagon. And the conjecture is that the clipped regular octagon is the most unpackable shape there is. Okay, so that's the conjecture from 1934. Uh, the corners, uh, he, he prescribes exactly how the corners are clipped. Uh, they are by uh, arcs of hyperbolas. Um, Reinhardt, in his uh, paper from in 1934 on this, observed that um, if it's, so he proved the existence of a minimizer. And he said that minimizer has to have the property that every point on the boundary is contributing to the minimality property. So if, if there's part on the boundary of the disk that is not on one of these minimizing hexagons, then you'd be able to clip that part of the boundary and make an even smaller area and it wouldn't be optimal. So um, what you have is the property that every point on the boundary of the minimizer has to belong to one of these hexagons of minimal areas that will, will tile. So let me show a picture of this. Uh, so this is from a blog post by John Baez, and uh, the graphic was done by the science fiction writer Greg Egan. Um, and you see the uh, smooth octagon, and it's rolling around. And as it rolls around, the density of the packing is staying constant. So that's, that's the remarkable property that this uh, um, octagon has. And if you take um, at, at a, any given point in time, uh, you can take the tangent lines where you have contacts and you get a hexagon, uh, centrally symmetric hexagon, and that hexagon is tiling. So that's, um, so this is the property. So, so if you remember one thing about my talk, remember this picture, 
Uh, this um, rolling property is what makes it a candidate to be the minimizer. It's what makes it a candidate to be the most unpackable shape. Yes. How do you how do you spline the corners with hyperbolas when hyperbolas never really reach the right angle? Oh, so let me show you. Um, <laughs> so the asymptotes on the hyperbola is coming from the neighboring sides, as, okay. as you see here, and it's done in a way so that there are no corners to the uh, along the boundary. Okay, so that's the conjecture. Uh, okay, so. Even though we don't know that that's the minimizer, we know that the minimizer is going to have the same structure, that it's going to have this rolling property that every point on the boundary is going to be contributing to the optimality. This is just uh, another picture where you see the hexagons packed in different ways. Uh, that I just wanted to mention, um, several years after Reinhardt came up with the conjecture, Mahler looked at the conjecture independently and came up with the same conjecture. Um, in 1946, he made a weaker form of the conjecture called uh, Mahler's first conjecture, which is just that the uh, optimizer is a smooth polygon without saying that it had to have eight sides. And then a year later, he came up with exactly uh, Reinhardt's conjecture that it had to be a smooth octagon. Um, so my plan was to announce a proof of Muller's first at the lecture today, but it's not quite done, but it should we, sh we should soon have the proof. So uh, I'll give a sketch of how uh, the proof of Muller's first conjecture goes uh, with the understanding that there are a few computer calculations as a computer assisted proof, of course, uh, and uh, some of the computer calculations still need to be done, but we have a pretty solid outline of how the proof comes. Uh, just to give a, a digression, there's the Ulam conjecture in three dimensions, which is the corresponding question, what's the most unpackable shape in three dimensions? And the conjecture is that it's a sphere. And as far as anybody knows, um, that's what it is. Uh, why is the Ulam problem hard in three dimensions. Well, for every, you, you want to know what's most unpackable. For every candidate you're looking at, you first have to solve the packing problem for that shape. And uh, just the sphere packing problem is hard enough. Um, and if you then have to, you know, look at all the different competitors and solve the sphere packing problem or the you know, ellipsoid problem, packing problem for them or whatever, and then compare them all and then find the worst. It's uh, it's going to be a lot of work. Um, and then just a reminder, in higher dimensions, uh, we have Viazoska's breakthrough in eight and 24 dimensions, uh, but the sphere packing problem is still unsolved in dimensions other than Two, three, eight, twenty-four. Okay, so now uh, let me start explaining a few of the ideas of uh, how to think about uh, solving this problem. Uh, the first thing that's going to come in is uh, non-Euclidean geometry. Uh, we'll go from Euclidean to non-Euclidean. And there are different models of non-Euclidean geometry. There's sort of an upper half plane model, there's a disk model, there's a hyperboloid model, and all of these different models 
get used in the study of the Reinhardt problem. Uh, so here's just a couple more models. Of, uh, second, I, I just want to mention an analogy that's quite useful. This is what's called the Dubin's car problem. Uh, so here the problem is to start with a point and a direction as the initial position and a point and a direction as a terminal position. And the problem is to navigate the car from the initial position and direction to the terminal position and direction. Um, and you want to find the shortest path subject to a curvature constraint. And the solution to the problem is always to either at every, any given time to be going straight ahead or to be turning to the left or to the right with maximum curvature. Um, and uh, this is, if, if you think about the, the Reinhardt problem, there, there's sort of this, uh, well, I'll talk about bang, bang in, in just a minute, but this tendency to do push things as far as possible in the direction of non-convexity uh, to give the, uh, the smooth optical. So uh, the Dubin's problem is solved by optimal control. And what I want to do is introduce an optimal control problem to describe the boundary of the minimizer. So uh, the Dubin's car problems from optimal control, the bang bang solution, and since I'll explain in a moment, uh, Pontryagin gave uh, first order conditions for optimality in optimal control problems. So we'll introduce those first order conditions. And then there's some idea of uh, singular arcs that I'll also mention in a few minutes. Uh, so we want to look at the boundary. So we want to study the optimized, the optimizer. Uh, we're going to do this by writing down a differential equation for the boundary of the disk. Uh, if you look at Reinhardt's paper um, and kind of just take all the geometry from that paper, and put it into a differential equation. Uh, these are the differential equations that you get. Uh, you get the, the derivative. So we're starting with the element in the group, uh, two by two matrices with determinant one. Uh, that matrix, the derivative is equal to G times X, where X is an element of what's called the Lie algebra, the trace zero matrices. And then the derivative of X is given by a bracket with another matrix. Uh, so this uh, second equation is what's called a, a lax equation. And uh, think of this as, it, so it's well known that a plane curve can be specified by giving the curvature of the curve and then you solve a, a second order differential equation from the curvature to get back to the curve. And that's uh, what we're doing here. We've got a second order differential equation and we're getting, uh, we're specifying things through this matrix P sub U, which is giving the curvatures. Uh, we need to specify because of this hexagon property that, uh, that every point on the boundary is part of a minimizing hexagon, we need to specify not just one curve, but we need to specify two curves at the same time. And so we need to give two different curvatures at the same time. So the curvature is coming from uh, a two-dimensional set rather than a one-dimensional set. And these are the equations that we start out with and finding the right curvature, the right control 
um, is going to give us the solution to the Reinhardt problem. Okay, so questions about that? So these are the differential equations that we start out with. We want to um, we want to solve. Um, so the g and x from the differential equation come from SL2 uh, cross, and then the uh, x is uh, trace zero matrix, but it actually has, um, because of this lax equation, that has an isospectral property that forces the element x to be in the orbit of a particular matrix J. And that orbit is identified with, uh, can, can be identified with the upper half plane. And this is where the hyperbolic geometry is coming in. So with this, you can sort of forget about the original geometry and just work with the differential equation and solve, you want to solve this problem as an optimal control problem. That's a good, so, so G is acting on X by conjugation or by not translation? Um, is, it, is, it that, is, it, is that the X, just what translation? So this, um, this X, so you have an adjoint action of the group G on its Lie algebra, and that's the action we're taking. Okay. So it's conjugation. Plus. It's conjugation. Okay. And now, now I understand why it's the orbit of that. Why is that the half? Yeah. Yeah. So in general, an optimal control problem, we have some mm -hmm. uh, function that we're trying to minimize. Uh, we're given a differential equation. A uh, family of differential equations depending on a choice, um, in this case, a measurable control function, which for us is the curvature. And Montreogen has given us um, the setup for uh, finding critical points. So uh, you can do things with calculus of variations and Euler-Lagrange equation, or you can do things with optimal control. Uh, we've chosen to do things with optimal control, which uh, is more convenient for us. Uh, but instead of in calculus of variation, you have a Lagrangian that you're trying to minimize. Here we have a Hamiltonian function that's uh, on the cotangent space of our uh, Lie group that we're working with. And it's depending on the control set and taking values in the real numbers. And the maximum principle of Quantriagen says that you always pick the optimal control in such a way that at every point in the cotangent space, you're maximizing the Hamiltonian. So that's uh, Quantriagen's famous condition. And then you have other conditions such as the Hamiltonian is identically zero along extremals. And, uh, and Pontryagin also tells you that the optimal, so you've got this differential equation for the trajectory, uh, and then you've got this bigger space, the cotangent space, Pontryagin is telling you that the tra trajectory lifts up into the cotangent space um, by a flow given by the, in terms of the Hamiltonian. Uh, so, um, just simplifying the Reinhardt problem really comes down to classifying the periodic orbits of this dynamical system. Uh, the Reinhardt problem is what uh, I call a textbook example. If you're writing a book on control theory, and you wanted a good example to illustrate all the different facets of the theory, uh, the problem you'd want to pick is the Reinhardt problem for your textbook, uh, because so many uh, different aspects of the, the general theory show up in this particular problem. So uh, we see chaos, we see bang-bang, chattering, singular arcs. I won't go through all of these uh, 
In detail, we have conservation laws coming from uh, NERTA and symmetry. Uh, we have Lee theory coming up in different ways. Um, so forth. Can I make a short comment on the third one? That's interesting because the rope length critical single contact curves are exactly that line. Conservation laws are a bit of a Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so just to summarize, uh, the solution to this optimal control problem is going to give us a solution to the Reinhardt problem. And the connection uh, with non-Euclidean geometry comes through the group of two by two matrices with determinant one, uh, which is acting on the upper half plane. Um, and you can translate everything about the original problem into this context so that you're no longer talking about planar geometry. And in particular, if you want to know what the area of the disk is in terms of the setup, uh, you take the uh, hyperboloid model of the upper half plane and you look at the height function and you have a trajectory uh, coming from the differential equations. And if you integrate the height function along the trajectory, it turns out you get exactly the area of the disk back in the original Euclidean plane picture. Uh, so let me say a word about bang-bang controls. Um, so a bang-bang uh, control. This is a fairly common occurrence in optimal control problems. Um, is a solution that uh, suppose our control set is a convex set. Uh, a bang bang control is one that jumps from one extreme point of the control set to another, uh, usually in a discontinuous way. And so an example would be. Um, if you're wanting to park a car as fast as possible in a garage and the optimal strategy might be to step on the acceleration and go as fast as possible towards the garage until you're at a point where you're just about to crash into the garage and then stepping on the brakes as much as possible and then coming to a screeching halt right when you you know hit the edge of the the garage so that that would be an optimal strategy for parking as fast as possible <laughs> and that would be an example of a bang bang solution you're just doing one thing as much as possible and then you're switching to another strategy as much as possible and Control problems often have this, the, the optimal solution often has this, um, this structure to it. I so did I, that once with the TR6 manual transmission to get into the back of a 15 foot long U-Haul truck, literally, up a ramp <laughs> on the bed. Okay, so there's a... <laughs> no banging, just shifting <laughs> and brakes. Another example might be an, an optimal investment strategy. You want to give your money to charity, but uh, you spend the first half of your life earning as much money as possible, not putting anything into charity, going extreme in one direction, and then <laughs> right before you die, you shift another strategy and give it all away. So that would be a bang-bang solution. So the Dubin's car problem is a bang bang solution you're turning as much as possible one way and then turning as much as possible in another way the reinhardt smooth octagon is a bang once you look at it from the point of view of control theory you say okay this is a bang bang solution um so uh, one thing you can do is then write down Pontryagin's uh, conditions for an extremal and check that the smooth octagon satisfies all of um, 
Montreal Games condition. So the smooth octagon is a critical point in the sense of Montreal. Unfortunately, there are lots of critical points in the sense of Montreal. Um, uh, any you can generalize this, and any six k plus two gone is also giving a critical point. Uh, as uh, so, here we have and it's a 14 gone. Um, as you're increasing the number of sides, it's getting closer and closer to a circle. You get an infinite collection of critical points converging to the circle. The circle two is a Pontryagin extremal. Uh, it's a saddle point, so you can push away and do better, but first to first order, um, it's Pontryagin extremal. Uh, So let me come back to this. Uh, and so in summary so far, in 1934, Reinhardt proposed a smooth octagon. It can be formulated as an optimal control. Um, the smooth octagon is given by a bang-bang control. Um, it's similar to other problems in optimal control theory. And uh, it's uh, an extremal trajectory in the sense of country organ. So that's still not a proof that uh, the Reinhardt smooth octagon is the optimizer, but it at least is looking like a critical point. So let me talk about chattering. Uh, so chattering, so bang bang is where you're switching discontinuously from between different strategies. So you have a non continuous uh, control function. Uh, if you actually switch infinitely many times, say in a finite time interval, that's what we call chattering. Uh, so imagine, for instance, a heating system that you're trying to get it, the house to a certain temperature and it keeps switching on and off, trying to get it at just the right temperature, and if it's switching on and off, on and off, infinitely many times in a finite period of time, that's what we would call chattering. Okay, so chattering often comes up when you have a control that's too crude and to kind of do exactly what you're trying to do in a smooth way. And in our situation, chattering we think of the optimal shape that we're trying to find, a chattering solution would be like a polygon, a smooth polygon with infinitely many sides where the sides are getting smaller and smaller. So uh, chattering, uh, I wish that it didn't come up in the Reinhardt problem. Chattering does come up, uh, so we have So the, the Reinhardt problem would be fairly easy to solve if it didn't have a big fat singularity right in the middle of the problem. Uh, there's a really bad, when, when you look at the optimal control problem, it has a really bad singularity. And uh, we call this the singular locus. And we can prove that if you have any trajectory that doesn't pass through the singular locus, no chattering happens. But if you go to the singular locus, the only way to reach the singular locus is by a chattering solution. Uh, so the, um, the problem of uh, solving the Reinhardt conjecture really comes down to understanding this singularity and the nature of the chattering. Um, it also keeps us from doing things numerically by computer because things get very unstable numerically around chattering. Um, so we looked at a, a toy problem where we replace. So when you look at the problem, nearly all 
all parts of the Reinhardt problem have a rotational symmetry, except for this uh, control set where, where we're picking the curvatures, that's a triangle, a triangle doesn't have circular symmetry. Uh, but if we replace that triangle with a circle, we get a toy problem that has extra symmetry. And uh, this has a conservation law of angular momentum. And uh, then we have lots of conserved quantities, the Hamiltonian, angular momentum, uh, things coming from the Lax equations, it becomes easier to study. Um, it appears that we get chaos in the dynamical system. Uh, this is a plot from Mathematica. Uh, so this is an approval of chaos, but we start with very nearby initial conditions and see what happens. And the solutions diverge in a way that looks very much like other pictures that you see of uh, chaos. So it seems that we have it in our toy problem. Uh, so how do we deal with the singularity? Uh, near the singularity, we see sort of a self-similar scaling behavior. And uh, before turning to discrete geometry, I started out in uh, an area called Piatic Analysis, where you have um, valued fields. Uh, so evaluation is like a, a sort of like a norm or the log of a norm to measure the size of things. And to understand how the scaling laws work, uh, you do valuation analysis to see how rapidly the different terms and the differential equations are growing. And when you do that valuation analysis, uh, you truncate the terms in the differential equation, uh, just keeping the leading term and discarding all the higher order terms according to the valuation analysis. And when you do a truncation of the differential equation, you get a new differential equation, new dynamical system called the Fuller system. And the Fuller system uh, is really given by a fairly simple system of differential equations. And this uh, system is describing sort of the self-similar uh, limiting behavior as you go in towards the singularity. Uh, so from another point of view, you can think of this as uh, in algebraic geometry, you can blow up at a singular point, and this is sort of a, a blow up procedure to understand the behavior near the singularity. So, just to summarize to here, uh, the Pontryagin maximum principle gives the dynamical system. This is these are the differential equations for the boundary of the disk that we're looking for. Uh, it has unpleasant singularities uh, with chattering, self-similar behavior. We blow up and get a new dynamical system called the Fuller system. And then we do a full-blown global analysis of this Fuller system to understand what's going on. Uh -oh. So maybe I won't go through details, but maybe I'll just draw a picture. Uh, you have the singular locus. And what you find is that there is an outward spiral coming out. And then there's a time reversal symmetry that gives an inward spiral going in. And then um, the inward and outward spiral are unique up to um, the symmetries of the situation. And these are uh, relative equilibrium points. And then you show by global analysis that the outward spiral is an attract, globally attractive fixed point. So uh, any other trajectory is going to eventually converge onto the outward spiral. So that's what the global dynamics look like. Um, and that's that was for the toy problem. And then uh, you get a similar picture for the non-toy problem. I'll just, instead of having 
circular spirals, you get uh, triangular spirals. And with the same sort of behavior. Um, and then when you connect the fuller system, which is kind of this blown up local analysis around singularity with the original uh, Reinhardt system, you find you get these outward spirals that are not periodic. And so they can't be part of, they, they can't be the optimal solution. And and what that means is that you've completely analyzed the chattering solutions, which are the solutions with infinitely many sides, potentially. You rule those out, and that is what gives you uh, Mahler's first conjecture, saying that the solution has to be a smooth octagon. Uh, so by, anal by the analysis around the singular locus, you show that uh, the solution has to be a smooth polygon. And like I say, there are a few computational details still to work out, but uh, everything looks uh, pretty solid mathematically. So that's um, that's the strategy of what we're doing. And uh, maybe I'll take questions. Yes. So, Chris, once you have Mahler's first, like, is the strategy for getting to the smooth octagon, you know, enumerative? Or... Oh. Yeah. So, from the beginning, I wanted to do a computer proof, uh, but uh, there are two things that prevented us. First, we needed to compactify the problem, and that's been done. And then the second, there was the singular locus that where computer wasn't uh, up to dealing with the singularities. Uh, so I think now that we have an, an analysis of uh, the singular locus, uh, we should be able to do a complete exploration of the dynamical system. Um, I, I think it should, by similar methods, be possible to give uh, a reasonable upper bound on the number of sides that pile, the polygon can have, uh, because this, the further you are away from the singular locus, the fewer the the less the fewer the sides. Yeah, and this this may be a, a short sequence of more technical questions. So the, the first one was that the toy problem is acting on C3 complex three space. Is that is that some of the complexifier the Lie algebra and then forget that is oh, C3 some of the Yeah, yeah. So so we, we started with differential equations on the Lie group and Lie algebra, and then we ended up with uh, complex coordinates. Um, we call those hyperboloid coordinates. They're coming from the hyperboloid model of uh, non-Euclidean geometry. It's, it's spelled like SO3, C, and SO2. Yeah, so, so we go to SU11, we go from SL2R to SU11. The, the more technical things I find fascinating because the, the, the same type of chatter, I didn't know the term, comes up in. You, know, you want to have something piecewise. So maybe the question is, is the chat, the, the Sussman's, they're piecewise analytic, but the pieces get, could get arbitrarily small. That's the chattering. Phenomenon. Yes. Yeah. So, so this idea of having a toy solution, this is the problem that we encounter when studying a similar type of conservation thing. Maybe it's also a bang bang situation, but with certain kinds of critical rope. And that's why we can't get really piecewise analytic because there could be this ch chatter. Yeah, 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 yeah. But having a toy, a toy model to use to analyze a singular. So now I don't know what's the singularity that's behind the problems I thought about. It, it, it seems like a very general idea that uh, yeah, it's um, coming. 
Yes, and and, and even with the, the differential, I was quite surprised that we got exactly the fuller differential equations because the, the fuller differential equations come up in all sorts of chattering problems. And uh, yeah, we were really getting the same differential equations as other others do in other applications. Can I ask one sort of physical intuition? It's a little bit, so some people would be sloshing back and forth in a narrower and narrower well that the frequency gets higher and higher. It's, it, is that somehow what's, you know, physical you know, intuition? A lot of physicists here, I guess, uh, what's, what's leading to them? Um, so in our toy model, uh, so we don't have the bang bang solution, but, but, but we still get the, the spiral solutions are still winding infinitely many times on the way into the singular locus. Um, so it isn't just the discretization that's giving the bang, giving the uh, chattering type behavior. There's something more going on than that. Yeah. Um, I have a similar question about the chattering. When you draw the spiral, can, can you say what chattering looks like for the spiral? Or by this point, the spiral to somewhere inside the thing you set? So these are um, self similar logarithmic spirals and uh, the chattering corresponds to just the fact that the uh, the spiral is is looping infinitely many times on the way into the singular point so not not missing there what's that not getting there with this chattering it's not yeah you know, it reaches in finite time it, it loops infinitely many times in finite time Um, do you have a conjecture for what happens when you remove the centrally symmetric assumption? Mm -hmm. So it's uh, the conjecture is that it's a regular haptagon. Other packing, other packing densities for regular polygons, no, or no, no, no. not pass pentagon. Mm -hmm. Once you remove that symmetry, do you allow them to have? Um, Different orientations, or they all yes, to... yes. Mm -hmm. Did I understand the, the the thought progression where you first showed that the rounded octagon is a critical point, as it must be to be the solution? It's just not the only one. That's right. And so the second part was trying to get more clarity on whether it was the solution. Is that fair? Yes. How, how, what, what's the set of critical points? Is it? Uncountable, or is it? So we know of a countable set of critical points, but we don't know that we have all of the critical points. I think. What is, I mean, like wrong with the smoothed square or smoothed uh, hexagons? Cannot use them. Um, well, smooth squares have high density. Um, so the um, smooth decagon seems to be a critical point if you reverse the area. So, so if you um, are looking for a local maximizer of area rather than a local minimizer of area, the smooth decagon seems to be a critical point there. Any further questions? Can you elaborate a little bit of what you're still trying to do with the computer? I mean, it's, it's, are you just um, enumerating all these uh, solutions or are you using some sophisticated uh, proof program? Or I, it's hard for me to imagine what, what you mean with a computer-based proof in this case. Uh, so 
there are really two statements that haven't been completed. And one is the proof that this picture is as it seems. Um, so these are the outward trajectories uh, starting at the singular locus. And um, at first I was thinking we would need something like a verified ODE solver, but we actually have explicit um, analytic formulas for um, these trajectories. So it's just a matter of um, showing. Uh, so you can see where the switching occurs, where the sharp corners are on the trajectory. Um, it's just a matter of, uh, yeah, just doing verified arithmetic showing that this picture is is what it looks like. So that's one of the two statements. And then the other statement is on the non-toy fuller system showing it's a very highly non-continuous dynamical system. And we just need to show that there's uh, this unique equilibrium that's globally attractive. Well, okay, then let's thank Tom once again.